last year. Let's speak to Sam Lewis, who's a journalist, and Mike Buckley, who's a political commentator. They are a Friday panel tonight. Um, hello to you both. Thanks for being on. Evening. Uh, nice to have you. Um, Mike, I'm going to start with you. Um, uh, the Omicron variant is now pretty much um, rife, I think it's fair to say. There is uh, community transmission, and I think the experts will tell you that that is now probably uh, beyond being stopped. Um, as much as we can probably try. Uh, the country's bars and restaurants are being jammed, although some companies are now starting to take the measures to stop Christmas parties themselves. Uh, Jenny Harris, who's one of the government's scientific advisors, one of those people we've seen quite regularly up on stage talking alongside the Prime Minister, was quoted this week, Mike, saying that, um, that people should avoid uh, social contact now that perhaps they don't necessarily need uh, to take part in. The government line is to carry on. I think we can all acknowledge that none of us are virologists, so we come at this from a, 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 a limited view, unless you are. I don't know, maybe you can correct me on this one. Uh, but Mike, what do you think? I think two things, basically. I think, what, number one, in terms of Christmas parties and our social interaction over the next week or two, really it comes down to what risk do you want to take? And not only in terms of getting ill, and of course, happily, if you're double jabbed or triple jabbed, then... Even if you do get COVID, then you may get it mildly. Though you may not. I've got, and I've got quite a few friends actually who've got it at the moment. But two sprung to mind: one who's got it and he's been very ill actually, and he is he's recovering, which is a good thing. But he has been very unwell. Another one's got it; she's just got what's like a mild cold. So, but actually, if you get it, you don't know which one you are. But the other thing to take into account: if you go socialising, you catch COVID over the next few weeks, is you might end up self-isolating over Christmas. Is that what you want? So, particularly from the end of next week. Bear that in mind when you go out partying, because if you get it and you test positive, even if you feel well, then you're going to have to stay at home because that's the law. But the other thing I would say is I think the focus on Christmas parties, in a way, it lets the government off the hook, because what we should really be talking about is what measures should be brought in to limit all cases of coronavirus in this country, Delta, Omicron, you know, whatever it is, because otherwise people are getting needlessly ill, people are getting long COVID, people are being hospitalised, people are dying. We should avoid that. We could avoid that if the government brought more measures in, regardless of Christmas parties. And actually, some of us will go to Christmas parties, some of us won't. All of us get on transport, all of us go shopping. A lot of us have to go to work. A lot of us have got kids in schools. The government should be doing way more in all of those environments to keep us safe. Mm. Scott. Sorry, uh, Sam. Well, look, I mean... Sam, I'm so sorry, Sam. I'm so sorry, Sam. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, not only am I not a virologist, I'm not a very good radio presenter either. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Sam. Go no. ahead. <laughs> I mistake it myself as well. Um, I think Mike makes a lot of really good points there, actually. I mean, the fact is that this doesn't have to be all or nothing. On one end, it seems that people are saying, you know, the government should do nothing. Like, it's been two years. We should just give up on all uh, measures in place. And on the other, it is, right, we should cancel Christmas. We should, uh, you know, be working from home as much as possible, wearing masks and, you know, cancel all these Christmas parties, as you just mentioned. But, you know, I just had a friend that came over from New York, spent a great weekend here. And she was shocked by the lackadaisical attitudes that there were on the tube and, and people going into shops and that restaurants uh, didn't really check if you had COVID or not or, or what the last, if you had any symptoms. I mean, in New York, for example, you need two jabs in order to go into a restaurant to eat. I mean, I don't think we need to go that far, but certainly around Christmas parties, people should just be you know, sensible, have a lateral flow test. It takes 50 minutes. It costs a couple quid down at Boots. And mm. you know, if you have it, then you should not go to the christmas party if not then please you know go mm. ahead i mean you should, people should start doing this in general as well if they want to have christmas day dinner with their family i think you know i, I have been especially cautious because i spend a lot of time around my grandparents who are over the age of 80 years old so mm. i've had to i came back from malta a few months ago took a lateral flow test uh, legally because i had to after coming off the plane and then i took one again two days later and one again two days after that it's it's sort of just you know sensible things that people in general can be doing and we'll get through this a lot faster that, that does make sense sam but i, I wonder if there is the, the, if there needs to be a, a firmer piece of advice though here and 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 there almost needs to be because one of the things i've noticed i mean you, you you're right your friend was probably right about the fact that people haven't been wearing masks in enclosed places ventilation has been practically non-existent that's a really big thing a really big part of this whole process and you can walk into plenty of establishments pubs bars shops and um and and ventilation is often non-existent i, I walked down the train i'll tell you what though i'll tell you, I'll tell you something right I, I took a train um uh, on thursday last week a long train from manchester to london and i took a train back on tuesday and then i've been on a train again that same journey again today and i've noticed a massive difference a massive massive difference in that week and i suppose the difference surely mike is the government standing up in front of the country and saying 
guys, you need to do X, Y, Z. We're not virologists. We can't we can't read between the lines here. Uh, we're all trying to get on with our everyday life. And I wonder if there's something about Christmas parties. There needs to be a, a Christmas party specific piece of messaging. I think there needs to be clear messaging across the board. And, and I'll, I'll make the same point again. I think they need to be giving this clear messaging for the whole of our lives, not just for Christmas parties. You know, people will be socialising in lots of environments over the next week. They'll be going to the pub, they'll be going to nightclubs, they'll be going out for dinner. Yeah, some of those will be Christmas parties, some of them won't. So I think concentrating on do you go to the Christmas party or not is, is the wrong thing. Mm. The virus spread in, in any enclosed environment. Some of those over the next couple of weeks, of course, will be Christmas parties. Actually, the majority of social engagements over the next couple of weeks in this country will not be Christmas parties. So people need to be deciding, do I go and socialise or do I not, full stop? Mm. Or do I go into this crowded environment, whether it's a religious setting or whether it's, you know, a workplace or whether it's sending their kids to school or, you know, whatever it is. So actually, the government should be giving us clear messaging. They're not. On the one hand, you've got medical professionals repeatedly saying things like everybody should be working from home, we should be reducing socialising over the next few weeks, we've got a potentially dangerous new variant. And then you've got Boris Johnson and the minister saying, no, it's fine, just go and live your life. Presumably because they want us all out of spending money, and presumably because they don't want to be the unpopular party pooper, and pre presumably because they don't want to kill Christmas two years in a row. Well, if they don't do anything, we're going to have not only with more sick people and sadly more people losing their lives, but we may end up losing Christmas anyway. Or Christmas may indeed, we may have it, but then a few weeks later we may decide, you know what, it wasn't worth it because of the, the health costs mm. that will result. Which is kind of where we were last year, isn't it, really, to be honest? We're sort of, we're sort of back a bit where we were last year. Uh, perhaps with perhaps with the added protection of the of, of the vaccine, which will make a real big difference, um, uh, uh, notwithstanding Omicron. I'm going to a party tomorrow. I'm going to a, um, a 30th. I'm not on the show tomorrow night, uh, which will be a genuinely delightful news to rather a lot of people uh, who often occupy the tech screen here in front of me. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm going to a little party and and it's uh it's the 30th and it's a big old do and uh we're lateral flow testing and actually you kind of you, you do think actually we probably could do that i mean i'm sort of feeling a bit um, denying me it's one of my best mates so so i sort of have to go really i'm sort of feeling a bit obliged to go but there is definitely you you, you look at that you think there, there are definitely things that we can do to make that setting safe right there are things that we can that we can put in place to make sure that the the, the, the virus doesn't rip through that party and, and and knock us all out just in time for christmas uh, listen we need to get into some more hard politics there's been a by-election uh, in the last 24 48 hours or so a true blue tory seat that's had its majority slashed to just about four thousand from i think it was about nine 19,000 at one point. A 10% 10 a 10 swing to Labour uh, could tell you something. Low turnout could tell you a slightly different story. We'll see if there's anything that we can learn from that before 11 tonight on Talk Radio today. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Our Friday panel, uh, Friday panel uh, is on tonight as well. Uh, Mike Buckley is a political commentator and Sam Lewis, a journalist. We've got some hard politics to talk about, chaps. Uh, we had a by-election in the last 24 hours or so. Sid Cup and Old Bexley, which is a proper true blue seat. Uh, James Brokenshire, who sadly lost his life earlier this year, occupied it. A uh, wonderful, wonderful, brilliant man uh, who was a, a great par uh, parliamentarian as well as a decent bloke. Um, but politics moves, moves really quickly, and the Tories' majority there has been slashed quite significantly. Uh, a 10% swing to Labour as well, um, although a low turnout around 34% uh, compared to about 60% this time last year, uh, uh, 2019. Sam, I'm just going to throw it to you on this one. Take this where you want. What do you think? You've seen the results, you've seen the numbers, you've, you've, um, you've seen what the people of uh, Sid Cup and Old Blacksley think. Um, what do they think? What can we, uh, what, what can we learn? Look, I think, uh, I mean, this is a gentle warning to the Conservatives. I honestly do not think it's actually that much of a big deal. Like you do mention this 10% swing, um, you know, and that was from a 13% fall in, in the Tory vote versus a 7% increase in Labour's tally. But look, I mean, Labour have previously advanced by more than that in nearly a dozen elections since 2010, and they went on to lose each of the following general elections. So uh, they had by-elections where they won by similar percentages, but they've gone on to lose the, the general election that followed. You know, so even if the whole country had swung the same way that old Bexley did on Thursday, uh, Labour would ultimately just only have something like 300, 310 seats. So they wouldn't even have an overall majority. The more exciting thing to look at is in two weeks time um, when we go to North Shropshire for a by-election uh, where the Lib Dems have put in a lot. But in fact, the Lib Dem candidate lost her uh, election deposit in old Bexley simply because the Lib Dems have put so much effort and have really put all the money um, towards uh, campaigning in North Shropshire where they really see 
a chance to to upset the Tories. Mm. By the way, it's Old Bexley and Sidcup, isn't it? I was saying Sidcup and Old Bexley. Maybe, really seriously, maybe I should give virology a go. Um, I might actually be all right at it, better than this. Um, okay, Mike, you've been watching as well. You've 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 crunched the numbers. Sam says it's probably not really worth us uh, reading too far into it. What do you think? I mean, I think the result tells us that the polls are probably right. The polls are saying that the parties, Labour and Tory, are basically neck and neck, and the result in Old Brexit and Sidcock probably tells us that that is true. If Labour was, and I say this as a Labour person, so I'm not saying it makes me particularly happy, but I think if, if you know, if if the, the result would have had to be very different last night for Labour to be sitting there tonight thinking, yeah, we're cruising to power next time. So I'm not saying that that won't change over the next year or two, but based on the polls as they are now and based on the vote last night, which is admittedly one seat in one place on one night on a very cold night and it was low turnout and all of it. But based on that, it looks like the parties are basically neck and neck. If well, we know from historical precedent, that isn't good enough to expect a change of government next time around. But we also know that things can change. And we also know that the government isn't a particularly strong place over its handling of the pandemic, over its handling of the economy, over Brexit, over corruption, over Johnson's lies, over you know a whole host of things. So there are many, many ways for things to get worse for the government pretty quickly. But of course that hasn't happened yet. So, so like I agree with Sam, last night was not particularly momentous but we will see what happens in a couple of weeks. But of course, what happens in a couple of weeks will be, if, if there is a change, it will be most likely a Lib Dem win rather than a Conservative win based on the demographics and based on prior voting intention. So what does that mean for the Labour Party and a change of government? We don't know, even if the Lib Dems win the seat. I wonder if there is something, all, all those are fair points, and I think, I think all by-elections should be taken with a massive pinch of salt, shouldn't they? Uh, uh, without exception, there's all, there's all sorts of stuff going on uh, at a by-election. One thing that I wonder, I wonder if we can read into, and actually is really interesting, is where this tallies with how the constituency voted on Brexit. It's 62.43% leave, 37% remain, so a pretty, a pretty heavy uh, 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 leave seat. Sam, um, does that vindicate Keir Starmer in that he has managed to pick up some support at least, or that the, the Tory support has been eroded in a seat that previously uh, would have, you know, fallen perhaps quite heavily behind him uh, uh, around the, the, the Brexit issue? Keir Starmer has been very keen to not talk about the B word at all and go anywhere near it. Does this prove that perhaps we are now starting to vote on different lines beyond Brexit and that that's worked for Starmer? Not entirely. I think, I mean, you do make quite a good point. Like the central foundation of, of Johnson's victory in 2019 was the idea of uniting the Leave vote behind the Conservatives. And ultimately, you know, the Remain vote was fragmented between Labour, uh, the Lib Dems and, and the Greens. But um, ultimately, I, I don't see something like that really being affected. The thing that was really affecting the Tories here was the last three weeks worth of headlines, which were pretty appalling for the Tories. You know, it went from one crisis to the next. You know, if we're talking, you know, to bring up North Shropshire again, the Lib Dems seem to be saying that uh, the Peppa Pig, what the Peppa Pig debacle, you know, that speech where um, uh, he seemed to bring up Peppa Pig for a couple of minutes, he lost his space for 30 seconds. People are more concerned about that. And I think it's about the current travails. And there's certainly whether something like Brexit, now that Brexit is behind us, uh, will come up again. I'm, I'm not so sure. It's, it's more the, the cultural implications behind that. But Keir Starmer has certainly followed quite a good policy by not mentioning the b word um but i i certainly think that you know like i say this is a by-election not a general election there are other things that will be at play and that could then mm. go back into the leave camp versus the remain camp again once again in a few years time yeah god knows where politics is going to swing uh, mike what do you think i mean i mean uh, is there a point there that that starmer actually has been vindicated here and that not mentioning the b word has perhaps worked in his favor in a place that may have rejected uh, uh him uh, certainly did reject the labor party uh, a couple of years ago and had that leave vote united behind the Tories. Has that been a smart move, Mike, here? Uh, well, I could give you a very long answer on this, but we don't have time. I mean, in terms of the by-election, I think that it wasn't a Brexit election. I mean, neither main party was talking about Brexit, particularly going into the election. The Conservatives were all dead set to invoke Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol a few weeks ago, and then they backed off when they realised that would result in empty shelves and up to Christmas and decided that was probably a bad idea. But don't rule out them invoking Article 50 once we're past New Year. Seems to be the hot take on what they're going to do. And bizarrely, for a party that was all about getting Brexit done in 2019, they are the party that wants to keep Brexit going because they think it helps the, helps them unite the Leave vote and hence unite 
you know, the right wing votes. And one of the things that, that I think is true and is relevant about the by-election yesterday, actually, is that reform won 6.6 or 6.9 percent, I think, which is a lot. And of course, we only had Brexit because the Conservatives didn't like UKIP and wanted to unite the votes on the right. And so basically became UKIP. So if reform gets a new gig, either by talking about Brexit or by talking about migrants in the channel or something like that, that will terrify the Conservatives and will it doubtless shift the Conservatives more to the right. That would, of course, open up more space for Labour in the centre ground. So that that could be an interesting trajectory, but we'll just have to see what happens to reform you know, over the next few weeks and the next few months. In, uh, I'll just say briefly on terms of in terms of Keir and Brexit, mm. I think that Labour are missing a trick by not talking about it more because it, it's a disaster for our for our country. It's going to harm our economy far more than the pandemic uh, has and, and ever could. You know, so I think that Labour should actually make more hay by saying, hey, the Conservatives are screwing over the economy. It's going to make your life worse in the future. Okay. Labour may get there, but they certainly haven't got there yet. OK. All right, Mike, uh, Sam, stick about. We'll talk uh, a little bit of hard politics. A good bit of hard politics there, boys. I enjoyed that a lot. Um, uh, politics meets sports next. Lewis Hamilton's talked about feeling uncomfortable around the Saudi Arabia Grand Prix. That's happening this weekend. Is it time that sports and sports stars started boycotting these problematic countries? We'll ask that question before 11 on Talk Radio. Stick about 11222. Our Friday panel are with us uh, tonight. Sam Lewis is a journalist and Mike Buckley, a political commentator. Um, we need to talk about politics and sport, boys. We love having this conversation. We've done it before. I think maybe even you and I, Mike, um, have had this chat before. And I wanted to sort of check back in on where we are and see whether or not the dial is moving on this any or not. Because Lewis Hamilton uh, has talked this weekend about feeling a bit uncomfortable with taking part in the Grand Prix happening in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, of course, a place that has um, atrocious human rights issues, particularly around LGBTQ plus people. In fact, I think Lewis Hamilton's worn a, a rainbow coloured hat, um, uh, hat, hat, helmet, uh, for the uh, not, definitely not a virologist, definitely not a, an F1 expert either <laughs> uh, during the Grand Prix this weekend. I wonder if we need to reassess where we're at with problematic countries. Sam, I'm going to come to you on this one first. Are we at a point now where this idea of continuing to have these sports in countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar for the World Cup uh, next year and beyond is becoming uncomfortable and actually we need to pull back and a boycott might be the best option? Yes, I absolutely agree. I mean, sport is a soft power. The fact is that you know, a lot of these countries care so much about the image that comes with the sport that by not going, we actually dent them in some way and make them realise that they have to come to the table. I mean, another example you could give is currently what's going on uh, with Peng Shui in China. Uh, and, you know, there's now talk about a lot of people bought, uh, about countries boycotting the Beijing Olympics. You know, you know, if we quickly you know, talk about her, for example, uh, the WTA have pulled all their tournaments from China. They've taken the stance, but yet the ATP, the male equivalent, has said, oh, no, it doesn't really matter. We don't really care. Um, but the fact is, the way China has responded to previous uh, threats of, of saying that they'll, they'll, they've, they would be especially angry if countries were going to take themselves away from uh, and not go along to the Beijing Olympics, it shows that it would affect them. You know, when Dao Murray tweeted the image of uh, Fight for Freedom Stand with Hong Kong a couple of years ago, and China decided to ban the NBA for a couple of weeks. That shows that it really affects countries such as China. So in future, yeah, we should use sporting events as as uh, a way to get through diplomatically if other um, routes aren't being effective. Though I think in this particular case, Lewis Hamilton, if you really want to make a stance, shouldn't turn up. But I think because he's only eight points behind, he, that's not really you know uh, on his mind at present. But I think in general, yes, we should use sport as uh, a way to get through to other countries but also presumably that's actually that's actually quite a hard thing to do presumably for lewis hamilton to single singly to not turn up uh he'd probably be probably be fined uh, I, I just can't imagine that's a particularly easy thing to do although while well, i take your point sam absolutely uh put your money where your mouth is or your your um your points tally where your mouth is i suppose um mike I agree with everything that Samba said, and I think that we should use um, sport as as a soft power, basically, to try and influence. People. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not. not okay. In, in that case, then, Mike, let, let me just put this to you in, uh, for the for the sake of uh, uh, of sort of trying to get to the root of this problem and this issue, really. And 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 the other view is that something that Sebastian Vettel did this weekend is quite significant. Sebastian Vettel, who's a Formula One driver, uh, took women out to teach them go karting because only recently, several years ago, women were allowed to drive in Saudi Arabia. That was a really big moment and a really big statement. And you, you have to assume that to a degree, 
okay, we can probably describe it as sports washing to a point, but to a degree, the fact that the Formula One has been taking place in Saudi Arabia probably put a bit of pressure on authorities to do things like liberating women and their right to drive. And so are there examples that we can point to, Mike, where we go, actually, having these sports in these countries as difficult, as problematic, as uncomfortable as it might be for Lewis Hamilton does actually lead to social change? If that may be true, if it is, I don't know. But what we do know is that you know you mentioned UAE in the Olympics, and we know that they use, uh, I think they use slave labour. They certainly use a lot of uh, immigrant labour that I think lives in in very very poor conditions, and they may be paid something. But um, I think it, they would be conditions that would horrify us, you know, if we actually understood and knew the detail of what they were. I would imagine. I, I think people. I think I've read things saying that people have lost their lives in building the infrastructure that's going to be used in the olympics as well mm. however nice it is for somebody to go go-karting with somebody else who is still alive that doesn't change the situation it doesn't change the human rights record of the uae you know it would be the same with china you know in it china doesn't, it doesn't matter but, but do you take the point though do you take the point though that there is there is the potential to drive them to social chain social change when you put the spotlight of the world on them right and when and when formula one comes to a country it's incredibly difficult for them to ignore the fact that women can't drive in that country right it is, but I think I, I think I still I still land on the other side. I think actually the the comms hit that they get, you know, the footage that they will show on the sports shows, for example, will just make you know Saudi or UAE or wherever it is look good. There'll be lots of you know glorious shots, people having a great time, and you know lots of interviews with people, and it'll be shots of you know the the big politicians and the stars of that country, you know, looking great, and you know it, it'll all look wonderful. They will get the comms hit. I don't really understand why they want it so much, but they clearly do, because it's definitely something that, you know, nations on that we would look at as in other ways beyond the pale. They've done it for decades. I mean, Russia used to do it, of course, you know, sending a crack team to the Olympics every year because they wanted to win all the medals. They thought it made them look good. It's the same principle. And I think we just need to draw a line, really. And I think in terms of China, you know, to pick one country at random, of course, we have to engage with them on things like climate change. But otherwise, we need to draw a line in the sand and say what you're doing to the Uyghurs is 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 utterly wrong. And as a result, you shouldn't be hosting the Olympics when they're hosting the Winter Olympics. And of course, that's done now. But I don't think it should happen again. But that brings me to the other point I was going to make. When we talk about we, who is we? You know, it's the IOC that decides where the Olympics goes. It isn't the British government. It isn't the British people. It's not even, you know, the free democracies of the world. So if we're going to talk about we and what we do, what does that mean? Does that mean, you know, UK sports people? Does that mean the British government? Does that mean the British people have a view on whether somebody should go or whether they shouldn't? Do we load all of that onto an individual like Lewis Hamilton? Which is probably unfair, actually, because he's he's just doing his job. And, you know, the this, this you know, this tournament happens to take place in Saudi Arabia. He's got to do his job. And I, I don't blame him for going, actually. But I think we collectively should make a decision as to what happens and where it happens okay who, who should be in charge of that then, Sam? so if you're, if you're sam arguing that that um that, that that going to these countries and having these sporting tournaments in these countries um now is um we should pull back from and, and we should exercise sports soft power to boycott these places in order to highlight the problems who does make that decision i don't well, want I mean, to take decision sorry, sorry. guilty that was sorry, my mistake it's okay go ahead Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, but I mean, look, we have the, you know, Biden has, you know, in the next few weeks, we're going to have a summit for democracy where all the democracies of the world are coming together, all the democracies that are invited will come together and, dis and discuss what, democratic things, you know, what can be done to, to prevent uh, the rise of autocracy. I mean, this is potentially one of the things that they can discuss about uh, where they send their teams and, and who puts pressure on the IOC. I mean, obviously, the IOC behind the scenes, there can be diplomatic pressure put on them. I don't think you can simply. Uh, you know, say that they have to come up with one particular policy one way or another but you know this is something that has to be multilaterally pursued and it needs to get lots of countries involved and especially with sport you know it, this uh the sporting ban on south africa helped to end apartheid right you know and it contributed to the end of apartheid and the ioc leadership in this case should be called into question i'm, I'm not actually sure completely how the ioc leadership is made up and and what the voting rights are but i assume there is in some way, you know, America must have some influence behind the scenes. Britain must have some influence behind the scenes in the way that China has now influence within the WTO, within the WTO, within the WHO, and has prevented Taiwan from getting into those organizations and, and has stopped 
um, Taiwan having a say during the pandemic. You know, there's always something behind the scenes that can be mm. done by our Western countries. Okay, that's really interesting. Maybe the, maybe the, the dial is moving a little bit on that one, actually, and, and people are starting to, to see the potential power in uh, sports not showing up, uh, leaving a gap in some of those countries. Um Finally, boys, I want to talk about music um, uh, on a lighter note. I don't know if you saw this this week or not, but uh, Shane Phelan, who is the uh, who was the star of Westlife, I guess, um, uh, has talked about his band's music helping him through a really tough time, the death of his parents, actually. We're also gathering around Adele's album at the moment uh, as a, a place of solace after some, uh, some difficult times. Um, I-, I wondered, chaps, when music has played a part in your life and when it's uh, helped you through a difficult patch. Mike? I mean, I would I was thinking, looking at your list of things to talk about today and reading this, and I just thought, you know what, music helps me every day. And it's not like I'm going through a particularly difficult part of my life right now, other than the fact we're living in a global pandemic. You know, I mean, that's, that's kind of getting to all of us, I think. Yeah. Um, but you, music helps us all the time. I mean, there's, there's music that I go to when I want to cheer myself up, when I want to feel sad, when I want to feel comforted, when I want to feel reminded of a particular time or a particular, you know, period in, in history. And talking about... Um, uh, Shane and and his parents, which is obviously one of the biggest things that can happen. I mean, I'm just thinking now. My, my dad died in 2017, and I can remember now what albums I was going to then. You know, two in particular stand out to, to get me through. What were they? Can I ask you what they were? Uh, one I can't remember the name of it actually. The other one weirdly was the La La Land soundtrack, which is nothing to do with mortality or grief or anything. But I'd seen the movie. I liked the music. It was around at the time. It was just nice, and it was people being in love and having a nice time together, and so different from my genuinely horrific daily reality. Mm, you know, mm, mm. yeah, that's a really important point, isn't it? As well as kind of, I suppose, as well as the the Adele effect, which is kind of reflecting the trauma that you might feel. Um, there's something beautifully escapist in music, isn't there? As well, Sam, what do you think? I mean, it never has for me, really. I mean, I always find actually that if you listen to depressing music, you just feel depressed for longer. Or when you listen to happy music, you just start to feel happy. So I always try to to listen to happy music in general. Um, and I can definitely see how, how uh, La La Land help might get through a very tough time. I mean, I think the more important thing, at least for, for me, is uh, that, you know, creativity. A bit of creativity helps me get through things. I mean, during the pandemic early last year, I was able to get through it by, you know, writing, and I've started to try to write a novel uh, back then, you know, and that helped me get through it. And uh, I finished it. It's with the publisher. Oh, nice! um, You've actually done it. Wow! (laughs) Well done. A little plug in if I'm invited back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ultimately, (laughs) but ultimately, you know, it's you know, Adele was able to get over. She cemented. She was able to get over divorce and explain it to her child through the power of music. So of course, it's really important. And I think, you know, people have their own ways of of getting through it and. I think that creativity helps helps in this way. Mm, yeah, for sure. Alanis Morissette, for me, uh, where was it? Hand in my pocket, maybe uh, that that really got me through a really bad breakup. It was like it was properly screechy and uh, and a bit angry, or maybe it was ironic actually. Uh, but basically, anything by Alanis Morissette where she is screeching hard uh, at the world was uh, was really really helpful. But I often find actually that if 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 I'm in a really difficult spot. I, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I haven't really been in that very in very many of these um, uh, over the years. But you know, but if if you know if I am having a particularly down day, I don't really want to listen to music. Like I, it's I have something sort of shuts off with me. Remember, I, I think it was um, Richard Attenborough before he died talked about losing his losing quite a, a, a chunk of his family, a good few family members in the Boxing Day tsunami. Uh, in the east and how he couldn't listen to music for about 18 months he just couldn't listen to anything just couldn't take it in couldn't cope with taking it in for about 18 months which i thought was really fascinating uh, listen guys we're out of time but love to talk to you both thank you so much for your company this evening really appreciate it mike buckley political commentator uh, and sam lewis who is a journalist as well on our friday panel